Hello, everyone, and welcome to Autism Stories, where we connect you with amazing people that help autistic teens and adults become more independent and successful. I'm your host, Doug Bletcher, the founder of Autism Personal Coach. It really is essential to the mission of Autism Personal Coach in making sure all autistic teens and adults that we serve get the support they need regardless of race, gender, or sexual orientation. On today's episode, we talk with April Stevens, the founder of Autism from Another Spectrum, about why autistic African Americans don't always get the support from organizations that provide these supports to people with autism and what can be done to change that. We hope you enjoy today's conversation. April, thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me, Doug. It's always great to see you. So I wanted to start off and learn where does your story start in the autism community? Well, my story starts in the autism community when I noticed my son having what's considered autism symptoms at 18 months. And I brought it to the attention of my pediatrician, and she referred me to a neurologist who basically just hit his knee and said, oh, he's okay. His gait is a little off but there's no developmental concerns. Mm -hmm. And then the neurologist referred me to the speech therapist. They said, yep, he's okay. Which then I got referred back to the neurologist. So basically I was just uh, getting referred to all these different doctors, but my son wasn't getting helped. Um, He wasn't diagnosed until he was three years old. So by that time we had missed out on the very important early intervention services. As a matter of fact, my pediatrician didn't tell me about Help Me Grow or early intervention services, which means that he had to be put into like a special needs preschool. Um, So that is where my journey with (laughs) autism began when he was officially diagnosed with autism. So today I wanted to talk to you about the experience of African Americans within the autism community. And that really starts with diagnosis. I recently read a study that Caucasian children are 19% more likely than African American children to be diagnosed. What do you think some of the reasons for this is? Actually, I read a study where Caucasian children are likely to be diagnosed with autism 54 times more than African American children. So I don't know if that 19% includes that 54 times Mm. more, but that is a huge disparity. And there are a lot of reasons for that. So you just can't point the finger and say that they're not being diagnosed because they're not being treated fairly. Mm -hmm. Um, As African Americans, we have our internal and external challenges that we have to deal with. So let's talk about the external challenges because that's where it all begins, whether or not your child gets that diagnosis. I can tell you about my experience when I brought it to the attention of my pediatrician, my neurologist, my speech therapist, I wasn't taken very seriously, and I was explaining the symptoms. I mean, I was saying, well, he's walking on his tiptoes, he's flapping his arms, the words are disappearing, he's having sensory issues, and they were just like, oh, he's just a boy, he's mimicking what he sees at daycare, oh, he'll catch up. So one of the reasons that that happens is that a minority parent's concerns are not taken seriously by the medical professionals. So I advise parents now, like when I do my autism workshops and I talk to parents or I speak at these national autism conferences, start recording what you see at home because autism doesn't discriminate based on race. It affects every race, every culture, every ethnicity, and it is a global condition. So if you're not able to explain what you're seeing, videotape it, right? So it sounds like you, would you encourage parents to kind of really push forward in terms of getting that diagnosis? Because it sounds like if you didn't, that diagnosis may never have happened. Exactly. And if they, and I want people to understand that without that diagnosis, then they're not afforded the ability to have the proper therapies, treatments, school placement, Um, The teacher or whomever will say that your child is having behavioral issues, and it's not behavioral issues, they may have autism. Um, For example, I'll give you a perfect example. With sensory issues, bright light will cause people to, you know, hide because it's very bright. People with autism have different 
sensory issues. So they perceive things totally different. Um, and sound, if you see someone covering their ears with their hands, that is a sensory issue. So they may consider that a behavioral issue. And it's, you know, they can interpret that as, well, your child doesn't want to hear me talk or something silly like that. And that's another thing when you talk about autism and other special needs with African Americans, and not just African Americans, but multicultural people in particular, you have to deal with racism, prejudice, and bias. And with African American children, they are treated more harshly in the classroom compared to their white peers, um, and especially if they have special needs. And Ohio was like one of the worst states, according to the U.S. Office of Civil Rights. More kids with disabilities are suspended, and the majority are African American, and it's disproportionate, and there's no reason for it. Can you talk a little bit about those statistics? Because I think a lot of times people are not very familiar with that. Sure. Um, if you go to the U.S. Office of Civil Rights, they have all of the statistics there. And you can look at the charts showing the states, um, the percentage of children that are suspended from school, and it also breaks it down by race. So you have African American, you have Latino, you have Asian, white, Native American, and others. So when comparing white children with African American children, there's a big disproportionality when you look at the type of kids that are suspended, especially kids with special needs. And this is critical because you know we have that preschool to prison pipeline, right? And so if you have African American children being suspended from school, that is a pipeline to prison, especially depending on what's written down about that. And people have to understand that the person with the pen has the power to change the life trajectory of that person with autism, just based on what they write down. And that's pretty powerful. So it's important and critical that parents and caregivers are empowered to know their special education rights, but especially for African American children, because they are the ones that are most affected negatively. If they don't receive that diagnosis, if they don't get the therapies and treatments, if they don't get that IEP, then they're the ones that are going to fall through the cracks. And if you think about the number of African-American people and people of color in general, that is a lot of people that are being impacted negatively because of internal and external challenges. So that was the external challenges. Now let's talk about the internal challenges that we have. Autism is considered a stigma across racial lines, okay? However, in the African-American community, when you look at special needs, uh, mental health behavior, all of those things are considered a stigma. And no one is very accepting of their child being different or labeled because they know how people are treated when they are different or labeled. So that's our own internal challenge. Then you have to deal with pride, right? Then you have to deal with ego. And then you have to deal with denial and grief. And all of those emotions are things that parents that have people with autism in their family deal with. However, with African-Americans, it is more intense. And it's so intense that it prohibits them from getting the help that they need for their loved one affected by autism. Because you have a marginalized community to begin with. Exactly. You have a marginalized community to begin with. There's a lack of awareness of it. There's the stigma of it. And then let's talk about the financial resources to pay for all these wonderful therapies. Um, there are still some insurance companies that do not cover applied behavioral analysis therapy, which has been shown to work with some people with autism. Now, in addition to lack of diagnosis, misdiagnosis often uh, occurs. Yes. So what suggestions do you have for a person or family if they have not received their autism diagnosis, but they do believe that this is to be, this is a uh, reality for them? I would suggest they always get a second opinion. Never uh, go with the first. If you feel something in your gut that this is not right, I don't agree with this, then find another doctor to do the diagnosis. Because you have to go where the support is, right? And you're the only advocate for your loved one affected by autism. No one can explain what you've seen, what the person with autism has gone through, 
like you because you live with it every day, 24-7, 365 days. So don't be intimidated um, as well. Sometimes people can be intimidated because they don't understand the medical terms that are provided to them from the medical professionals doing the diagnosis. Um, I tell people that you have to be like a warrior or mama bear or papa bear or whatever you want to call it. Brother bear, sister yeah, bear. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But they need someone to advocate for them. And I just want to explain that with autism, it's like a spectrum. So you could be mildly affected and severely affected, right? But even if someone can communicate verbally, they may not understand social cues or social situations, which can cause some issues in life, in the classroom, especially in school and in the workforce, because guess what? They do grow up to become adults. So they're gonna need to um, advocate for themselves if they have that ability or have someone to advocate on their behalf. Mm -hmm. Now, diagnosis certainly drives treatment. So yes. once someone receives an autism diagnosis, then it's the question of what's next? Exactly. So essentially, how can I help myself or my child get the support that is needed? Uh, so my favorite class that I took in college was a psych class that taught me about, uh, it was a st stereotypes and biases class. Um, in that class, we talked about how we all have conscious and unconscious biases. Yes. So how much of an impact do you think that affects African Americans getting the support services they need? Uh, I mentioned bias, racism, and prejudice, which are all systemic, definitely affect the ability of African Americans to get the support that is required to have a positive life outcome for people that are affected by autism. If we got rid of bias, prejudice, and racism, what a wonderful world we would live in, right? But we have to deal with those things, unfortunately. And the best way to counteract those items are to become aware, become educated, become empowered, and be the change that you want to see. I remember when my son was diagnosed, uh, the first two weeks, I was just an emotional mess. I was like, how do you deal with this diagnosis that has no known... Um, way of happening and no known cure, how do you, it can be overwhelming, um, but through a lot of work and, and faith, you know, I strongly believe in, in God and thank God because otherwise it'd be in a, a mental institution or something when you think of all the things that you have to go through as an African American affected by autism. And I say African American affected by autism because not only is my son affected, but he affects our family, he affects, you know, school, work, every everything. And people don't every think of that. Every aspect of your life. Exactly, yeah. just like a typical child, right? So when you look at that, you just have to become empowered and learn your special education rights uh, through rights law, uh, which is very effective. You know, sometimes case law can change because it used to be that the school system would segregate special needs students because they weren't able to keep up in the typical classroom. Well, due to a case law that just passed this year, they can no longer use that excuse because in essence, it is segregation. Are there some specific things that you feel like people can do to deal with their unconscious or unfortunately conscious biases? I would say recognize it. And I know people say there's conscious and unconscious bias. However, I do this. I do believe that certain people know they have a bias. Certain people are not held accountable for those biases, and they don't care how that affects other people's lives because they're not held accountable for those biases. Speak up. Yes, exactly. Speak up. Recognize that we all have biases, right? There's just certain food that I like and certain food that I don't like. But when it comes to human beings, we have to rise to the occasion and treat everybody equally. Because when you treat everyone equally, we all win. And when you don't, we all fail in one way or the other. Now, I really hope Autism Personal Coach is thought to be an ally for people with autism, regardless of race, gender, or sexual orientation. So what suggestions can you not only give to our organization, but other organizations out there that are supporting autistic African-Americans to help them get the support they need? 
I would say treat everyone equally. Realize the disproportionate treatment that African Americans and other multicultural people receive. Um, don't brush it under the carpet. You know, don't roll your eyes. Those are called like microaggressions, which are very impactful to people. And like little snide remarks that are made behind closed doors, which really have an impact on people. That can be negative. If you turn that around though, those remarks can be positive. If you take out the sexuality, the ethnicity, the age, the income that the family is receiving, you would be amazed how people are treated according to income, which is terrible. You know, a child has no control over what that family makes every year, none whatsoever. Right. Or the adult. You know, I keep saying child because my son is still, well, he's a young man now. <laughs> so he's 14 years old. But they do grow up to become adults. And that person has no control over the situation they were born in, um, including sexual orientation. You know, people and organizations say, we support all affected by autism. Well, do you really? Do you really? What action are you taking to, exactly, to show that? To make sure that that is a fact and not just a slogan. So what I really respect about you is that you don't just talk about this essential issue, but you back it up with action and an effort to make real change. Yes. So not too long ago, you started a consulting business, uh, Autism from Another Spectrum. Yes. Can you tell our listeners about the mission of your business and how they can go about learning more about what you do? Sure. Um, I started Autism from Another Spectrum because I didn't want other parents of color to go through what I experienced. I didn't want them to go through knowing that their child is having some type of symptoms or some type of condition and it's not being taken seriously from medical professionals. So I've been blessed to speak at national autism conferences on this topic, not just in front of uh, parents and caregivers, but also in front of the medical professionals, the therapists, the teachers, the principals, so that it's like a community forum and we can talk about it in, in real talk. Like there's no judgment there. So um, I'm also doing like autism workshops. So I'm going to the communities that are underserved and it's through the Akron Main Library. So I'll be at the Maple Valley Branch Library September, 20, excuse me, September 30th. And we'll be at the Main Library September 26th at 6 p.m. And at the Maple Valley Branch Library September 30th at 6.30 p.m. It's free for people to come in, which is great. Everyone is invited, you know, if you want to learn about autism if you want to share your experience. So I'll be able to explain what autism is, the internal, external challenges, and how parents and caregivers can empower themselves. I think when you empower people or educate them, that is like, that's a gift. Um, because then you take them to a place from zero to 100. Now they know about autism. They know where to go for support, resources, referrals. They know about their special education laws, which is critical when you have someone in autism, especially in the educational system. Well, April, I really appreciate the conversation. It's an important uh, discussion to have, and uh, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Doug. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about autism in African Americans and what we can do as a society to make it better. Thank you for listening to today's episode, and thank you to April so much for the conversation. If you wanted to get in contact with April and Autism from Another Spectrum, you can find them on Facebook or can give them a call at 833-203-2327. I think having allies is essential to all people with autism. However, the determination of being an ally really is up to the people you support. Hopefully, Autism Personal Coach is determined to be one of those allies. Even if we are thought to be an ally today, though, that doesn't mean we are thought to be an ally tomorrow. That really is earned on a daily basis, not by just the words you say, but by taking action to show you're an ally. So the question that all that want to be an ally should really be thinking about is, what have I done today to earn that label? 
On the next episode of Autism Stories, we talk with Dr. Jen Malia about the importance of self-advocacy. Talk to you then. Sometimes we wish we were normal. We hope you understand. This is not fun at all. There are some times we fear we can't improve. Everyone around us has said that we've improved. Taking longer to study, longer to learn. It also takes us longer to complete tasks at hand. Having Asperger's. are different from you one human to who am I I'm a human too I'm just like you